Good evening. Welcome to Hingham School Committee, February 22nd, 2016, 7.30 p.m. We'll call the meeting to order. First order business, approval of minutes. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Finished to be into the packet on time, sir. So just, just for the people in the audience there, um, we met, uh, our original scheduled meeting was Monday, February 8th, which was canceled because of the snowstorm. So then it moved to Thursday, February 11th, and with the break, we don't have any minutes, so we'll move on to Section 3.0. Questions and comments. Audience comments are always welcomed as agenda items are discussed. The school committee has set aside 15 minutes of this on this agenda to enable members of the audience to raise questions and make comments on any matter of general concern that is not on the agenda. Are there any? Oh, yes. We have a guest. Please come up front. Please state your name, your address. I'm a little nervous. That's all right. Take your time. Um, Hi, my name is Megan Rowan, and I am a parent here in um, Hingham. Um, I'm just going to read so that I can be very quick, because I know you have a lot of things on your agenda. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of parents that share some concerns about the way our nation is educating our youth. We are here tonight because we know that Hingham schools are in a very fortunate position of having extremely talented and dedicated teachers, staff, and administrators. We also know that the Hingham community is one filled with intelligent and creative people. It is our hope that we can use our community and our schools to develop a cutting edge approach to educating our children. An approach that could tackle the following concerns and change the way our students learn and how they feel about learning. Our first concern is homework. In this community we strive for excellence. We want the best for our children. We want them to work hard and gain a solid work, work ethic that will support them through life. However, research shows that children around our nation are becoming more anxious and stressed out. My sixth grade daughter spends on average three to six hours on homework every night. I know that while she is an extreme case, I have also heard that other students are struggling with this as well. This is causing my 11-year-old child to feel completely overwhelmed and to lose her enthusiasm for school and learning. The response to sign off after 20 <coughs> minutes per subject does not really seem like the best solution to me. The child is left feeling like they have not completed a task. This can be distressing for some children, and also, we're not really preparing them for the real world. There may be nights where projects and assignments require that three-hour window, and they should learn that at those times they will need to work longer, and some tasks will need to have that attention given, and so they need to learn to follow through on those. If we sign off, we're telling them it's okay not to complete. There may be a way to sign meaningful homework that can be completed within an appropriate time frame. So I would suggest that we relook at homework and ask if each assignment is truly meaningful and will it actually enhance the child's understanding. Our second concern, and this is something that's been um, talked a lot about between parents and the community, is recess and lunch breaks. Um, health and wellness are a very important part of our children's educational experience. While we are not against the new proposed wellness center at the high school, we do feel that there are some other simple things that can be done each day with all the students in the district that can help them develop healthy habits and refuel their minds and bodies. Recess is a very important part of this process. Allowing children to go outside in the fresh air and play in an unstructured way is extremely important to their development. Our children should be going out every day for recess unless the weather is unsafe. At the moment, students are having indoor recess way too often. The amount of recess also seems insufficient for our youngest students. Our older students do not have any recess, and we feel that developmentally, students in grades six through eight would benefit greatly from an active break in the middle of the day. Our older students in the high school could also benefit from a break. Perhaps practice an instrument, do some yoga, run on the track, read a book outside in the courtyard, paint, or use this new proposed wellness center. Our students work so hard, and we think that we should be teaching them how to pause and refuel. Lastly, curriculum and assessment are a huge issue and concern for us and I think the rest of the nation. We know that our system was designed during the Industrial Revolution. We have computers to do those jobs now, so let's get creative. We are educating our children to be innovators. Can our district bring in programs like Reverse Classroom? And can we move forward with our inquiry-based learning to create classrooms that are cross-curricular and possibly even multi-aged? Can we place less emphasis on standardized tests 
and really focus on assessments that are student driven. We know that tonight is an important night to speak about budgets and facilities and faculty and we do understand the importance of all of these things. We hope that we have also though maybe started some dialogue that we could perhaps begin to investigate these concerns and possibly shift our system. I believe that Hingham can be revolutionary in their approach to education. Maybe we can start by surveying current parents to have better understanding of these concerns. We would also like the opportunity to speak with the education subcommittee to continue this discussion. Thank you so much for your time. Megan, wait, you don't get to walk away. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You, you don't get to speak and then not let us talk to you. Uh, what street were you uh, live on first? I'm sorry, 71 Wampatuck Road. 71 Wampatuck. Does anyone on the committee have some questions or comments first? Um, I'd just like to thank you for the issues that you raised. You said we a number of times. Is this what other parents have signed this statement with you? I didn't have anybody sign oh. a statement. Okay. I have had conversations with mm -hmm. people. I wanted tonight to just be an opening dialogue. Mm -hmm. I think to just get the ball rolling. Sure. I've heard things very casually around town and then I've had a few meetings with parents. Okay. And this is something that I think all parents are concerned with. I don't think it's an issue that's just for Hingham. I think we've all heard it. Sure. It's, it's something that's going around the nation. And I just see our town as such a successful town and we have such a strong school system that I think that we could be, like I said, revolutionary in our thinking and the way that we approach education. Um, so sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, you to come to, please, you gotta come to the top. So my name's Megan Hansen. Start one sec, I started to be rude. You have to say into the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Because you're on TV. Okay, okay, so I'm Megan Hansen, 28 Fearing Road, and Megan and I have met with a few other people, um, you know, just for coffee and along the, you know, along the, throughout the year, just for chats, mm -hmm. you know, um, and not in any kind of a real critical way, but just to kind of brainstorm and, and discuss our children's education and how lucky we are to be in this town, um, you know, but also seeing as our kids are growing <coughs> and looking at other parts of the nation or other schools, how maybe there could be some changes we could make. Um, I know it's not easy. You know, and we appreciate everything that happens in our town. So it's it's we want to make sure that we're clear on that. Sure. Um, so there are a number of us, but the two of us are sort of the ones leading the You're show. You're spearheading the effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for tonight. For tonight. For yes. tonight. And right. again, this is just we're sure. trying to open up dialogue. Like I said, we would really love if we could put together some sort of survey with. There is an education subcommittee, correct? I was. Well, that's that's about so that. that's the advisory committee. The advisory committee. So okay. the. The town has an advisory committee which is appointed okay. by, uh, you know, it's appointed by other boards and everything. And there's an educational subcommittee. Yeah. And they're in the audience right now. Right. Uh, and they're experts on us. Well, but all, all they do is review our budget. Yeah. They don't play a role <laughs> so in education. You would want to be talking to, to yeah. us. Right. We but have a special education subcommittee that okay. deals with special education issues. We don't have necessarily a subcommittee that deals with curriculum mm. and educational matters we tend to leave those things to the educators right. because but, we're not educators. Mm -hmm. But you do have community outreach with yeah. Cynthia Galco, who's okay. head of, so she'd be a good person. Okay. And then I'm also gonna let Dr. Gallo speak, but also Ellen, who's our assistant superintendent who does a lot with the curriculum. Yeah. Would also, and a lot of times like, oh. yeah. Support, yeah. if you don't mind. Yeah. And one of the issues you raise on assessments, mm -hmm. um, please be aware I personally have tried to pay attention deeply to what's going on in Massachusetts and shared that with the committee and have attended some hearings about the park testing. And Dr. Gallo has been quite outspoken <laughs> on, on <coughs> you know, slowing down the process and doing what's right for students. And our, you know, we've voted to stay with the MCAS test instead of moving to park because we didn't feel that that was the right thing for our students yet. So we are paying attention to those issues. A lot of those decisions are made at the state level right. and I've spoken with Representative Bradley about it. Um, you know, I, we can talk to you further about this, but some of the, you know, those decisions are being made above us, mm -hmm. um, but I'll let Dr. Gallo and uh, Ellen Keene speak to, to, the, to the other issues, but w we are paying attention to those issues, so I am glad that you tell us that you're right. paying well, attention. We're fully aware that right. this is not 
just a our town thing. right we understand mm -hmm. that you as a school committee and um, dr. Gallo have to you know mm -hmm. kind of fit within what the state is is saying we're just wondering if I just think we are so creative in this town I think that we can change a little bit and move out of our kind of the way that we've been doing things for a long time I think that we could kind of try to be a little bit more innovative in how we're doing things and still try to fit within that and, and I don't know if it's even possible I just have a, a sixth grader that's coming home crying mm -hmm. and she loves to learn and, it, and it's it's disheartening for me and I just I think we just have so many wonderful minds in this community that I think that we could be that school that is changes how we do things mm -hmm. and um, I totally understand I'm not saying we have to, can you I know, interrupt oh, you for a second because we only have three more minutes okay. on this <laughs> sorry, sorry. so I'd like yeah. dr. Gallo to speak yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming. Yeah. Uh, certainly the concerns you raise about things like homework and, and, and stress that, um, that children are experiencing these days are not new, new uh, stories to us. In fact, one of our district-wide goals this year is looking at student anxiety and stress and um, um, the situations that we find ourselves in with so many of our younger children either just coming to school having very, very stressful lives for a whole bunch of reasons, not all necessarily related. Um, and so that is kind of a major goal, looking at that. Um, we've had speakers in, it's a, it's a major professional development topic for our leadership team, which is a group of all of our uh, principals, assistant principals, directors, resource teachers, central office, and so on. We're all working on that this, this year. And it has many, many faces, different at the elementary school where you mentioned recess and outdoor recess and that kind of thing and you know certainly um, Ellen and I get together each month with the principals uh, all of the principals Ellen also gets together with the elementary principals and certainly we can talk about some of those uh, those things um, there was actually a wonderful uh, article uh, in a paper that circulated today and I uh, gave you all a copy and sent a copy to Liza in particular about park and it was it's always wonderful when somebody writes something that is what you believe. <laughs> and I've always believed that one of the things about a uh, park in particular <coughs> is that uh, there are very creative questions, very high reading level, very complicated questions. And even if we master the, uh, the technology to give the test and get the results, we're not going to have a clue as to what those results mean because the reading level of the test itself is very challenging. So we'll get results. Someone above oh. us will draw all kinds of wonderful conclusions and then put labels on districts or schools or children or teachers. And that's unfortunate. But uh, this is a great article, and I certainly can get it to you if you would like. I, I would say um, the idea of doing a survey, I think that what might be more effective for some of the things you're talking about, things like resource, recess and homework and so on, might be better getting feedback through things like forums rather than uh, simply a, a test, that, a, a survey that may not ask a question that everyone can relate to. Mm -hmm. But getting people into a group can do two things. You can get information, but you also have an opportunity for maybe making some, some plans and taking some action out of that. Uh, I would make one comment, and, and it has to do with your comment uh, about sometimes you have to fit within the box. Uh, if we were to uh, add recess, uh, additional time for recess or, or um, uh, other kind of break at the middle school, uh, we would have to add on to the length of the school day because the state, the people above us, mandate a certain number of uh, hours and minutes. And things like recess and passing time at the secondary and lunch are not counted in that. So that's a real challenge at that level. Not so much at the elementary, there's still the same number of minutes, but at the elementary, there's more allowance. They have fewer of those minutes that they have to do in the course of a year, 900 of them, as opposed to 900 secondary, that you can fit in a bit more things that are uh, less, less structured. So, so there are always those things, but it doesn't mean that those things need to stand in the way of doing anything. It may just be that you have to do something different, come up with a more creative idea. So. Uh, but uh, certainly Ellen would be uh, happy to meet, meet with you. Uh, and I will mention uh, the things that relate to the elementary at the next administrative committee meeting, which is uh, administrative council, which is the group of central office and principals who meet once a month. So the more specific you can be about particular concerns, the better, because uh, we'll have a better sense of what you would like to see happen. 
Does anyone have any last comments? Ray? So, just quick questions. You're not from here, right, originally? I am. I grew up in Hingham. You grew up in Hingham? I went to Hingham High. Proud graduate. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, that, that's great. That's great to hear because I got the I kind of got the impression that that you were from someplace else. But that's that's a good thing. How many kids do you have? I have two children. So sixth grade and I have a second grader. He's, second grader. He's not in the public school yet. Okay, um, you know, <coughs> so you know, Liza <coughs> talked about you know the standardized test, the standardized testing, and we're all following that very closely. Mm -hmm. um, we're all interested in curriculum issues, and we discuss them. Um, at, at some length, even though it's the educators who really delve into that, uh, that topic deeply. But, you know, the issues that you brought up, we've talked about time and time again. Homework, we've, we've changed the way we look at homework at the middle school level already, and I think we need to look at it again. Um, you know, I agree with you on recess as well. I have a seventh grader. He could use some time during the day, right? Um, so I get that. Um, and there's no way that you should have a child coming home crying or upset because she's that stressed out. I would encourage you not only to talk to Ellen, but to seek out um, the counselor. We have been, and, and I have to say, that's why we are so proud to be part of this system. Yeah. Everybody that we've talked to has been very, very supportive. So this is not a criticism. Right. No, of course. Right. And um, we have, we, and we, we work with Mrs. Green at the, at the middle school, and she has been absolutely fabulous in helping, helping my daughter make that transition to middle school and feel more comfortable yeah um, the transition is a challenge for a lot of kids you know they're 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 comforted at the elementary level in so many ways even though they're challenged at the same time and then very often that transition to sixth grade is a lot bigger for some kids than other kids mm -hmm. um, it's just a shifting of the gears and mm -hmm. it's it's an awakening for a lot of kids and you know, for my own kids, we've had to really focus them, and at times, you know, that's hard for them. Um, so I, I, I feel for you, I really do, because the transition is a challenge. Um, and it's not just, it's, I don't want to say it's completely sink or swim, but it almost is. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. vastly different than mm -hmm. elementary school. Mm -hmm. And um, as much as we'd like to make it an easier <coughs> transition, there are still requirements mm -hmm. of that age level as they move up. So it, it's a challenge, but I, I certainly would like to talk to you some more about it. I look forward to trying to find a way to make your daughter more comfortable. Awesome. So it's Megan and Megan. Yes, <laughs> just a comment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. One comment the first Megan said, uh, she felt bad about coming forward because with the budget discussions, we'd rather talk about education than budget. <laughs> so don't feel about that. And my last comment I'll let you go is, um, there are three positions available for the school committee this year. So feel free to pull out your papers and run for school committee since you definitely have the interest. And uh, good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. Cynthia and also Ellen are the people to reach yeah, out to. Wonderful. Thank, right. you so Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, number four, superintendent's report. Dr. Gallo. Yes, um, I wanted to call your attention to a wonderful article that was in the uh, journal um, last uh, Thursday about our ambassadors uh, group at Hingham Middle School and uh, the wonderful service project they did in making um, over 100 handmade valentines that went to folks at Neville Place Assisted Living and Neville Center. <clears throat> for nursing care in Cambridge. So uh, congratulations to those folks. There are lots and lots of things going on, I know, at the high school, but I'm not going to mention those, Brad, because I'm sure you have it all under control. Um, I, I did want to mention to you that uh, in your packet tonight is um, the uh, one literature about one of the five, um, one of the, the standards by which the high school will be um, accredited. Uh, part of the New England Association of uh, Secondary Schools and, and uh, Schools and Colleges, and I included Standard Five, which is about school culture, uh, in there because you are part of that standard. You are referred to in there as M I and as uh, is the high school principal. So um, I have to come up with uh, a, a brief narrative about how we meet two of the standards in particular. We have many subcommittees meeting right now at the high school during this year under, undertaking the uh, self-study, and uh, they are doing research, so this is a subcommittee for Standard 5, and um, 
I've been asked to provide some response and some backup for that response for standards for indicators 11 and 12 there. So down at the bottom of that uh, one-sided sheet, you have our indicators 11 and 12. So I have a lot of ideas about what I can put there, and it really is the extent to which um, you as school committee uh, members and, and I as a superintendent support uh, Paula and the staff at the high school in carrying out their uh, their mission. So if you have any thoughts on any of those things and what we might give for a justification, I have a lot of thoughts, but always happy to get ideas. So just uh, send me an email or make a comment and uh, uh, I have to send something to them, a draft of what I'm going to do by next um, Tuesday, I think it is. so. <clears throat> Certainly it's not homework, but um, if you feel inclined and would like to uh, comment or just see what the process is like, um, there are a number of other standards as well. This one is the one that happens to hit uh, you folks. And one of the things that will happen when the visiting team comes here, which will be in the fall of 2017, <coughs> is that on the Sunday afternoon they will schedule a time to meet with members of the school committee, however may, many who may want to come. Uh, to that and uh, they will have read the self-study and done a tour of the building and so on and and they will be asking uh, asking you questions and um, um, may even ask about the responses to those particular two uh, two indicators so um, from time to time as the high school is completing its self-study I would like to include you in terms of how the process works and in particular what kinds of things they need to write and uh, and respond to and so this is the first of uh, what will be several, I think, over the course of the next uh, the next year. So that is in your packet. When in your packet, I think uh, I think this morning. And any questions for Dr. Gallo in the superintendent's report? Five point one communications received from the superintendent. Uh, just this morning, <coughs> I got a second letter from the Suburban Coalition that also is in your electronic packet, and it's just reminding uh, us of a topic that is on our agenda late, uh, later uh, about their request for um, support for a, um, a resolution, resolution and, and that you will uh, act on later tonight. Uh, it does say in it that uh, as of the writing of that email, which came this morning, uh, seven communities um, had uh, responded, and they're all listed there, and they're encouraging other people to come forward with that. So um, that's in there. We'll get to the agenda piece later, and I think that is it. The other thing I was going to mention was this article, which I think really is concise and well done and says exactly what I would have written, and that is, so we're going to do this test. We're going to do it electronically, and we're going to have questions we can practice, and then we'll get back the results, and we won't have a clue as to what those results mean because of the way the questions are worded. And I think that's sad and inane and lots of other, lots of other words, but the article puts it well. Student communications, Brad. Sorry, if I'm a little stiffly, but it's coming out a little cold. Um, all right. At this week's assembly, the Drama Club will be presenting an assortment of Edgar Allan Poe poems in the form of a short show, which we, which they will be performing for the Drama Guild competition, and it will also be performed Thursday night at 7 p.m. at the high school for free, and at Duxbury at 3 p.m. on Saturday, but that will cost $10. Both girls and boys basketball and girls and boys hockey teams have uh, advanced to tournament play, and the girls basketball team currently has their best record at 14-4 and four this season. Uh, the green team is accepting art for the first recycled art contest. The, pr uh, sorry. the pieces will be shown during Green Week at the end of March, and the win winner will receive a $100 prize, and all, all entries must be made out of recycled material. Wrestling ended the season undefeated and finished second place at the Division II South Sectional Tournament over vacation, and two of the student wrestlers will be going to states. And the t Teacher of the Month is Mrs. Whitney. Uh, debate team will have their last debate this Wednesday with multiple teams in contention for competing in the final debate. And, yep, yeah, that's all. Any questions or comments? Did right. you have a nice break? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I visit a few colleges, but snow Which kind ones? of. Um, Bowdoin? No. <laughs> that's, where Julia, that's where Julia's going right now. Okay. 
Yeah, we visited New York, and then the snowstorm kind of canceled that trip a little bit, but it was still a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you. Just FYI, we're not meeting in two weeks. We're meeting in three weeks. All right. So March 14th. Thank you. Yep. Um, Lastly, just other communications. Good news, bad news. As you all saw in the paper, we were on the front page for Fitness Center to get workout of the of the Hingham Journal. Disappointing was there was an editorial by the editor in chief. Um, I think a little. Bit, I thought there some of the facts were not accurately stated. So my plan of action is I will gonna. I think I did speak with Mary Ford. She said we don't have to get a response in by tomorrow. We could wait a week, but I think it's important to get the facts updated. So I'm going to draft something, at, you know, finish up my draft, send it to you guys. So that will be in by the close of business tomorrow. And then we can see if we want to do something else the following week. I would have wished that, um, you know, from my point of view, um, we've all put a lot of work into this. Ray in the long range sub, uh, Ray in the long range planning subcommittee has done a lot of work. We've talked about this at town forum. It, our advisory subcommittee has not even fully weighed in, and I would have wished that this just didn't happen now. But the good news is we are on the front page of the paper, so hopefully we'll uh, gain some support. Uh, moving right along. Andy, yeah. One more sure. We have kindergarten registration uh, coming up. It starts on uh, March 1st and goes through March 18th. So we have brand new packets that we tried to make more user friendly this year. And um, we had a meeting this morning with the secretary, something that we didn't do last year at the elementary level. Uh, to give them a little more information about what, uh, um, how the process works, and we're hoping to be able to get information in uh, sooner than we did last year, particularly as to the number of children who register and those who uh, are paying a tuition and what that tuition is, because it's very stressful, it was last year, to wait until nearly September to be sure that we were fully funded, and we were. We hope to be again this year. but. Um, you'll hear later this evening that one of the biggest unknowns we have with all those other things related to the budget is the kindergarten and grade one registration numbers because we just are flying blind. Um, we've had one year of the experience with the full day and how that might impact not only the kindergarten enrollment but the grade one enrollment. So, so that's important for us. Next Monday and Thursday, Monday in the evening here in this room. I'm not, it's not Monday, it's Tuesday, um, at 7 p.m. and then on Thursday in this room at 9.30 uh, in the morning, we'll have an information session. That's not an orientation meeting for parents. It's not a time when you would bring your child, but it is a time for folks who are perhaps struggling with the decision about full day versus half day, understanding what the program is about, um, struggling with many the many forms that we ask folks to fill out and just trying to get general information about the program are welcome to come. Can you repeat the dates again? Yes, so it's it's March first, which is Monday also election day, mm -hmm. and that meeting Tuesday. is here Tuesday, at March 1st. I'm sorry, I keep saying Monday. March first and Tuesday. Um, the meeting is in the evening here at seven and a similar meeting will be held uh, here on Thursday at nine thirty in the morning. And so Ellen and I will be here. We'll have a parent um, who will be here as well, Mary uh, Eastwood, a, a principal, and Laura Donovan, who has been our consultant for the year, former wonderful kindergarten teacher in, in Hingham. And last but not least, I want to recognize that uh, my, my partner here, my partner in crime for 15 years, uh, Ellen, has announced that she's going to be retiring um, next summer. And so um, she's notified members of the school committee and, and peer colleagues among our leadership team. And uh, certainly I want to uh, say thank you, congratulate Ellen. Um, we've worked together for 15 years. We still talk <laughs> cordially <laughs> almost every day. Uh, so, um, so you'll be hearing about the process that we will be doing. A, we will be doing a search and um, there will be a process that uh, involves members of, uh, of the community, uh, probably two school committee members, a couple of administrators and others that will be on a screening committee that will look at applications and uh, identify people that will bring into uh, to be interviewed. So there'll be more that you hear about it, but we thought you should all hear it and the public should hear it 
uh, as soon as possible. So as of now, everybody with a need to know. I think so. Maybe not everybody with a want to know, but everybody with a need to know is, uh, is appropriately notified. So congratulations. All. Thanks. Thank you very much. You're here. Um, good. Uh, moving on to new business. 6.1, 6.2, 6.3 are sort of intertwined. And since they might cross over, I'm just going to say that Dr. Gallo and John are going to basically cover them all in once. And so 6.1 is to hear an update on the administration's proposal preliminary operating budget for fiscal 17. 6.2 to continue discussion about transportation and the bus bid and take action as may be appropriate. And 6.3 to con continue discussion on the preliminary budget and act on the S school committee FY17 operating budget. Did you want to start with the buses? I think we should start with the buses. Okay. The other two can connect to one another. Yeah. But it all is intertwined. That's why I figured mm -hmm. might as well just do it once. Um, so on, on the bus update, the, the last meeting we, um, uh, <coughs> you know, we talked about whether we would have to like vote that um, the bid that's currently outstanding today. And I did get to first student. We had a conversation. So the, the there is a possibility. I mean, we don't have to do the vote today. We can delay it. We don't want to delay it much, uh, you know, much longer. By the March 14th meeting would be ideal. Um, the the, the very real key would be sort of ordering those buses. If we decided to do the new, the new buses, ordering the buses and get them there on time. Since we're already engaged with first student, we use their buses. I did ask. I said so. If they would still be pushing to try to get those buses here for us for August, it's whether the manufacturer Thomas Buses would be able to get those buses um, all delivered by the beginning of August. But in any event, first student, he did say, We're not going to leave you uh, stranded. You know, you'd be able to use those buses. If some came in, we'd, we'd mix the fleet up so that you could continue our operations. Because I did tell him that, you know, we may not be ready to commit to the, to the bus bid yet. <coughs> um, so I wouldn't be able to give him the award, um, you know, as a result of this meeting. So we do have the ability to delay that. Um, I think that's good news. Um, and our operations come school in September will be fine, you know, one way or the other. Um, and, you know, possibly if, if, if on March 14th if the committee did decide to go with the new buses, maybe we would still have all new buses. They typically like to get a year, you know, before uh, sometime in December to guarantee the August delivery, but that doesn't mean someone with the clout of first student, which they're a very big player. I mean, they may have a lot of clout with their manufacturer, so they would certainly try their best to get those buses in by August because it works much better for their operation too. You know, they have plans where the old buses go someplace else and the new buses get phased in. Um, I, I don't know if you, you know, you saw some comments that after the meeting, Patrick had watched this meeting in its entirety, um, on that night and he called me up the next day and he said, John, if, if only they were here Friday morning and saw that, you know, that the buses didn't start. So I said, well, you know, Patrick said, Patrick is a, is a very good bus supervisor. I mean, they keep those buses running. There are problems. I don't hear about all the problems all the time, which is, is very good. But he called me up because he wanted to make sure. It's like, I want you to know that there are things that are happening, and these are the types that are happening, and that he fears that they'll continue to happen and happen even more if we continue with the older buses. Um, I don't know if you want me to recap those events or you just read them. Um, but, you know, there, there, there have been breakdowns. Um, the buses are much more difficult to start in the morning. You know, and, and that's what, of course, is a cold. John, just since this is televised and since this is a big item on our budget, yep. I think you should take a couple minutes and go into some of the details. Okay. Yeah. So the, the you know, buses with them being nine-year-old buses now, ten-year-old buses tomorrow uh, or next year, the on these cold days, it, even though they have good batteries, you know, the compression starts going in the buses, okay? So they're much more difficult to start. On the very, very cold days, there's guys coming in a couple hours earlier to try to get all the buses started. For example, that last Sunday when we hit that sub below zero temperatures, I mean, we did have an event, so the bus had to go. So Patrick got there about a half an hour early and stuff, and it took about 20 minutes to get the bus started. Because you can't just crank it up or else you'll kill the battery. So you got to sort of like, you know, go slowly. So picture that here's a school day. You know, we, he does have guys coming in, or I shouldn't say guys, employees coming in, drivers coming in to get all the buses started earlier. Um, but it can be quite a challenge, okay? Uh, we have had over the, the life of these 
buses. We have identified seven buses or so that uh, there's, there's something about when they get on the highway, they overheat too much, and then they, they lose their, their speed. So they tend to slow down and stuff, and you can't ride them at 55 miles an hour anymore. They go down to 30, so they end up pulling over to the side. So those buses have actually been banned from the highway. Patrick knows which buses Patrick they are. Banned them, no other third party. Right, right, right. <coughs> Patrick, I mean, our, our own protocols, we've said, okay, we're not going to take these buses on the highway because we've had a history where they've all of a sudden slowed down. Um, you know, there's buses. Uh, where there was a bus event in Lowell with the... Um, with the row team, it was up there. And these are typically on weekends, too. Um, an oil leak was there, so they, they, they got stranded. Another one was in Marshfield. Um, a, a battery died. Um, you know, batteries can die. We all know batteries can die, but um, the older the car gets, the more likely that, you know, things are going to start to fail. So, anyways, I, I think the long and short of this is that the buses are showing their age, you know, they're, they are supposed to be maintained by first student, and they are maintained by first <coughs> student. But just the fact that they're old, there's nothing you can do to replace the compression or the internals of the parts. You know, you just can't replace every part and then all of a sudden have a brand new, ha have a brand new bus. So we keep them running, but it can be a challenge. Does anybody have any questions for John? So just one thing for clarification. Hypothetically, if we do move forward with the buses and they all arrive December 1st, we're paying the old rate plus the 5% to December 1st? Or? We would pay the, we, we would have adequate budget funds there because we pay the old rate and then when the new ones come in, we'd start paying the new rate. Gotcha. Okay, yes. I did clarify that because I wanted to make sure that, you know, in the, in the event that that happened, that I had sufficient budget money. And clearly, right. if we received these buses, I did, I did tell him that we would not, um, we would not enforce the penalty that it is in this contract, okay? The bid says if you, after August 1st, for every day late, it's $90 a day per bus. So that could be a lot of money, okay? And I said, this would be our doing. We wouldn't do it, and therefore, you know, I wouldn't impose that penalty, okay? So we would have adequate funding if we use the portion of the old buses plus the new buses. There's not, like, a penalty for doing that. Yeah, I do have a question. Shoot. So, John, we use 19 buses, but we have 20, correct? Uh, we use uh, 20 buses, but we have 20. I'm sorry, we have 21. That's right, 21. We really have 22 because first students will always put another on because when one breaks down, we still have to have a spare. So, so essentially two extras. Yeah, even though we, but we only pay for one. Right, we pay for one, so we use 20 regularly. Right? That's correct. But I think we increased at some point. Yeah, <coughs> a few years ago. How often, <coughs> how often does a bus break down? Do we know how often a bus breaks down so we have to utilize that spare? Um, I don't have those statistics, no. Um, the, I, I mean, I could ask Patrick that. You know, we, di we don't generate those type of statistics, but... It's the really often that there's something goes wrong and it, yeah. it doesn't start more likely in the cold weather. It just right. doesn't start. But the day that I was there on the snowy day, I went over in the morning and people was getting snow off the buses and there were two that they had a hard time starting but then they had the two spares and the just the fact that uh, first student has given us a second spare I think is a suggestion that um, the problem is um, more often than than yeah not. and they go out for maintenance so they would go out for maintenance so then that spear would be there and then once they go out for maintenance and we use the spear we do want them to bring us another spear that's why there's two okay you know because you can't can't leave us with 20 buses because if one breaks down we're stuck so I only ask that because I know when we talked about this in the past we asked you specifically and you know there was kind of an indication that you know mechanically we don't seem to have any significant problems but it's clear after reading Patrick's yes information which was not provided and you explained so for the folks in the room and at home that you know we have a bus dispatcher who used to be a driver Yes. And, you know, we have a lease with first student and they have a mechanic on duty and we have drivers who come in to help start the buses and the transportation department handles those issues and you don't necessarily hear on a day-to-day -day basis about, like, for instance, do you know nope. that at 2.37 this afternoon, bus 20 
had a mechanical failure and did not show up at PRS to pick up kids. <laughs> I did not. No, you didn't. Right. Would but you? I did yes. because I had a kid who <laughs> takes bus 20. So I got that notification. Right. And we were told that it was going to be at least a half an hour before kids could okay. be picked up and brought home. It actually ended up being a shorter time, about 15 minutes of a wait rather than 30 minutes. But there is one perfect example that happened this afternoon that John was not aware of that I'm sure the transportation department handled in-house, and I'm sure that's just one of thousands of occurrences, right? Yeah. That shows you that there are mechanical issues with these buses that you know maybe right. you weren't aware of. And I not, missed not two calls. I missed two calls from Patrick yep. today. I was on another call. I saw the line pop up. I kept meaning to get back to him, but I didn't get back to him. So he may have, but I, he may have wanted to tell me this just because he knew the meeting was tonight. Right. But typically. The things go wrong, and he just takes care of it. He just so having makes our buses keep Patrick running. Was great. There's yes. three three pages in our packets of information about the bus uh, situation and and a comparison of, of different models and and uh, um, fuel savings. He fuel gave savings. Us information about fuel tests, savings. Tests, conclusions. It, it was good information. Right. I'm very appreciate. And the public should know. So our the mechanic from first student is on from six to ten in the morning you know, to help us get the buses started. It's not like a full-time mechanic. Um, you know, they'll, they'll if they have a, a major repair on a bus, they will leave a bus and they'll take that bus back to their garage to, to service it. But we have one on day, every day from 6 to 10 to help get the buses started. But there's one person and there's 20 buses, so our guys come in early and do their, and very successfully. I mean, by and large, um, we're getting kids to school on time all the time safely and getting them home all the time safely and that's through the hard work of, of Patrick and, uh, and all the drivers. I mean they're, they're a great group. Okay. Any other questions for John? All right. There's no reason to vote on this yet now or yeah. consider it because we'd rather hear mm -hmm. the other parts of the <laughs> pieces of the puzzle. And, and just uh, to kind of finish the <coughs> discussion for folks at home or folks who haven't uh, been tuned in as we have uh, uh, as regularly to the budget, uh, that where this is now is that there are uh, in the transportation line in the budget uh, there is a base amount there is an amount that is in the added request for the budget to enable us to go out uh, to bid which we have already done for a new five-year lease on buses it was something that was in last year's um, budget requests and we uh, eliminated that uh, deferring to uh, postpone um, the five-year um, uh, bid process and to use the buses for one more year. So we've done that now. So now we're facing with a similar decision uh, because we're faced with having to make uh, rather substantial cuts in our budget. So one of the things, <coughs> the reason this is such a discussion point, is that we could uh, defer again accepting this bid and doing a lengthy lease to keep the buses that we have going for one more year. And that would be a less costly amount, an increment of about $11,000 as opposed to the 119 or so uh, with the fuel a additive um, that it would cost to accept the new bid. So that's why we're spending so much time on it, because it's a big chunk at a time when we need to make some serious reductions. So this presentation is pretty short. Um, we, uh, yeah. <coughs> lights. Oh, sure, sure. I'm sorry. I didn't. <coughs> And certainly, most of us in this room have been together many times, either in person or, or by phone or Skype or whatever. Over the last week, we met on the 11th, as Andy said, uh, a meeting having been uh, moved from the 8th because of a snowstorm. And ever since then, there have been um, meetings. And every night this week, there are at least two meetings that I know of, and uh, uh, a lot of votes are, are going to be taken. So um, this is the update for February 22nd. Uh, the original budget figure is there. We started out with a budget, and you're going to see it in a minute on a bigger slide, so I won't go over it, but we have the budget with the <coughs> blue, regular ed, the green, special ed, and the uh, red is vocational. And the total and budget that we started with was a 7.9% increase and a dollar value recommendation of $48,862,649, but we've come a long way since then. 
the budget was presented as a base budget and some additional yes. recommendations and these are requests that have come through our process which means that they've come uh, from principals and directors and then down here uh, and um, and John and Ellen and I got together and put together the original budget and uh, these are the things that were put in there as additions. I do want to spend a minute on this because uh, I'm not going to go over through every single item but I do want to point out one thing that may not be clear. Um, if you go about halfway down in the left hand column where it says transition tutor at the middle school and then under that new middle school guidance counselor there are two different figures for those. The transition tutor would be a tutor hourly uh, uh, rate, a certain number of hours, uh, five hours a day for a program much like the program that we have at the high school. Uh, and that cost would be 27 to 85. If we add a fourth guidance counselor at the high school, uh, the cost would be 63,980. There are pros and cons to both of these ways of dealing with a need. The most important thing is the need. And the need is a need that's not related to enrollment, but a need that's related to uh, youngsters and families who need uh, more support in a variety of ways. So one way to address that need would be to hire another counselor, and that would uh, lower the ratio uh, of uh, students and therefore families uh, to counselors, and that would be uh, of a help to a large number of students. Another way to deal with the same kind of need is to provide some greater support for children with fairly significant issues and challenges, particularly related to social, emotional, anxiety, stress, those kinds of things. And that would help uh, certainly the youngsters who would attend the transition room, but it would also help um, to take some stress off daily visits to guidance counselors by some of the children that, that have the, uh, the greatest number of issues that need attention. And uh, so that would uh, benefit everybody as well. Something we pointed out on the first night, but I think it perhaps got lost in the translation because John and I were going over the meeting that, uh, that we attended, uh, John in person and me virtually the other day. I think there might have been some confusion about that uh, with, with, with your committee, so we just want to clarify it. So you see two numbers there, one for the counselor and one for the transition tutor, just so you would know what uh, the options were. Both of those numbers accounted in the total, the 754,929. They're in that total, but only one of them, the bigger number, the 63,000 number, is actually in the base, incorporated into the, the budget. So we're only, if we do any of these, uh, it would only be one. And uh, we heard some school committee comments at the last meeting. Uh, and there was uh, some support, I think, for both of those. But it, for example, if we were going to do the transition rather than the counselor, we would remove the counselor, the 63,000, and put in its place the 27. The reason I want to stress it, however, is that the two numbers are here in the 754. Only one of the two numbers, the bigger one, is in the detail of the budget. Um, the other thing I want to comment on here is that uh, as of the last meeting, uh, we did uh, remove, or at least recommended, because the school committee hasn't voted on its budget yet, but uh, we uh, recommended removing the driver for a 21st bus and uh, also removing the 21st bus. So we still have the bus bid to be the 20 buses we've had for several years now. Uh, and then the spares that would be provided as just spares. So that um, number has come out as well. So that number, the 754,929, is really smaller by the increment for the um, transition tutor, the 27,285, is not in the main budget, even though it's listed on this sheet and neither is the number 55037, which was removed last week because of the um, reduction of the 21st bus. So just want to make that clear so that as we're going through the, the numbers, um, and I, I know uh, both Dan and Jim have wonderful spreadsheets with a lot of information, we want to be sure that that piece of it is clear. Doc, just a question on that. Mm -hmm. So 
I think we understand that because we're used to you doing it that way. Yeah. But maybe the better way is to, if you're going to list it in, in a grouping of additions, quote unquote, mm -hmm. don't put it in the base. Wait until a decision is made on the addition before it gets added to the base. And well, that way you don't have to take something the... out and there's no misunderstanding as to what's in, what's not. And mm -hmm. there's really a dupl duplication. Right, the larger numbers. There's not duplication in the budget figure, but on this summary of these things on this page. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have made some other changes as well. So on January 21st, uh, we started with the the original budget is in the blue. On all of these next pages, in the blue is the original budget. So 48862649. It was a 7.59 percent increase. <coughs> Uh, and you can see regular and special ed. I'm going to focus tonight mainly on the total budget because that's what we've been talking about and the need to reduce um, uh, from the total budget figure. So we uh, were on that uh, night able to identify $84,833 in savings. And so now if you go to the green at the end of the evening on January 21st, we were at 7.41% increase. 48777766 was the, the uh, was the total at that point. And those were one era and the other two were personnel changes that happened through the course of this uh, this whole process. So they are not reductions per se, they're just new pieces of new information about people. Someone takes a leave, someone retires, someone comes back from a leave, that kind of uh, thing. On February 11th, which was a week ago, um, last Thursday, um, we still have the same preliminary budget, the blue, um, but we made a number of reductions there. The original 84 is listed on that sheet. We had some additional personnel reductions, um, two leaves of absence from regular education and two leaves of absence from special education. Um, there's the transportation, the reduction of the 21st bus and driver. The total of that was 55037, so that came off of that other list as well. And then we uh, identified some um, ways that we could use the offset to support several different functions uh, in, our, in our budget. And uh, John did meet with Kathy and they discussed those things. We think this is a, a source of revenue that is, is ongoing because that is a very successful business and uh, we're going to treat it as a business that pays for uh, the uh, health insurance of the, of the employees that work in Kids in Action and as well there are some offsets there in the 1200 account, the 3300 account, 4120 and 4220. So, so offsets for, for example, uh, custodial help, uh, utilities, transportation, those sorts of things. So the total number of de deducts as of the 11th was $338,180. And then that adjustment, the right hand, lower right in the green, brought the budget, um, and that's the overall budget, to 6.85% uh, or 48 million five hundred twenty-four thousand four hundred sixty-nine dollars And then last Thursday, a uh, number of us uh, either attended or, or attended virtually a uh, ADCOM uh, education subcommittee uh, meeting where that uh, subcommittee uh, discussed their thoughts about um, the, the challenge of finding some good balance between the revenues that are available uh, to the town and therefore for support of operating and the needs that we have uh, and, and other departments as well but are certainly expressed by this budget. And so that became the starting point for discussion, that 6.85% um, increase. So this evening, we had an enormous challenge. Um, first of all, um, identifying those things that we uh, thought that we could live without, but realizing as well that um, there were some painful uh, consequences of some of the decisions we would make. So, so my goal this evening is to identify an additional amount of money that we feel, I feel, John, I think, would agree, uh, comfortable that we could not easily live without but manage with. Uh, but it isn't all the way to the goal that was uh, laid out for us at the uh, ADCOM Education Subcommittee meeting last week. 
as we left that meeting, our, our understanding was that uh, in order to get to the point where we were at a figure that uh, they felt that they could uh, give some support to, that we needed to reduce the equivalent of everything that was in the new request um, list, on the new request list. And that's why I want to clarify tonight exactly what was on there. We needed to reduce all of those things. And in addition, reduce another $341,000. And at that point, we would be at uh, a budget that represented a 4.8% increase over the current year, FY16, the year that we're in. Um, and so we began looking at what could go. And I always look first at things that are just kind of normal uh, changes in the, in the course of, uh, of, doing, of doing business. So we had only a few of those things. Of course, last week was a vacation week, so um, we didn't get a lot of uh, mail with people announcing, except for Ellen, uh, new <laughs> retirement information. Um, it was that meeting on Thursday night. It, it could have been that, yeah. Um, <laughs> So anyway, we always look for those things, and so I found some of those. Next, I looked at the list of the additional requests, um, because I believe we were expected to do that and needed to do that as well. And then we looked in a couple of other places. And so instead of recommending to you today a list, and I have a list that will get us to a number, but I'm not sure that I want to put that list specifically out there to all of you because you all need to see it first and digest it, and we haven't had that opportunity in the brief time since Thursday to now, to know whether or not you would agree that those are the things that, um, that need to go. So there is a list because I want to uh, give you confidence that we can get to a number that I'm going to uh, suggest you give some consideration to. But that list... Um, adds up to $500,021 in addition to the 338180, which means that if we were to adopt this list, or at least the number it represents, then we will have um, deducted $838,201 from the uh, budget that we originally presented and that at that point, we would be at a budget that is at 5.75%, 4802444848. Now, it's not where um, the Education Subcommittee would like for us to be. It's not also not where we would like to be, but um, we have some reality that we're uh, needing to deal with um, here. So we'll come back to this, uh, this number and in particular to the $500,021. So I'm not going to tell you all the things that are in it, but just to give you a sense of how <coughs> we can reduce a half million dollars from this budget. Half million dollars is roughly a percent, a little more than a percent on the budget. Again, I looked for known, known, that means we have a piece of paper that announces somebody is doing something. Uh, changes in personnel, either a retirement, there's one retirement in there, not Ellen's, uh, another retirement, uh, extending leaves, those folks that are out there that have to let us know by March 1st, there's still a number of them that haven't decided, but 67616 uh, is a way to reduce the bottom line without having to cut anything. And then additional reductions beyond the bus, beyond the taking the um, uh, the transition person out of that list. Additional requests uh, that are reduced, some eliminated entirely, sadly, and others where we have some reduced funding, such as for the SPED position. Uh, the one position that was supported from the list to remain in was the special ed uh, position that is uh, in support of um, the Student Services uh, Director's Office. Um, but we did reduce even that from 70,000 allocation to 35,000. And then there were a couple of other requests that we thought we could uh, reduce without totally eliminating. But we're not at the end of the process yet, so I'm not sure where all of that is going to go. There were some other things that we could do, such as we could increase uh, activity fee, for example. 
we could reduce the allowance that we have in there for collective bargaining because of some new information that we have. So other kinds of reductions. In particular, just as an example, if we were to increase the athletic fee by 25,000, that means going from 325 to 350 for most kids. And if we assume two thirds of the 1,200 students at the high school, 800 students uh, times 25,000, then that would be an increase of $20,000, not a lot of money. Now, every penny, as we're looking at the budget today, is important, but one tends to think that there are much bigger uh, numbers in some of the uh, reductions that might be suggested. And then I said to John, we've got to get it down some more. So I'm not a risk taker, usually, um, but when I look at the things that are still out there unknown, uh, I am confident that we will have $100,000 more in yet unconfirmed uh, personnel changes. That means possible additional retirements and or leaves of absence. So that gives us the total of 500,021. So the bulk of that, the 302,000, comes from our list of new requests, additional reductions to the list of new requests. Beyond um, taking out the, <coughs> the, um, the, the bus and beyond taking off that duplicate number and beyond uh, reducing the SPED position request by, by half. So we're still in a situation where there are many, many, many unknowns. And, and it's not just the school committee and the school department that has many unknowns. Virtually everything in town hall is rolling around with, uh, with uncertainty and unknowns and new information to come along. And um, so we're not, we're not out there alone. Personnel categories, they're always out there. Special ed, we still don't have tuition rate decisions by either the schools, individual <coughs> schools, or the collaborative, or the uh, operational services decision, a division that sets rate requests. Uh, anticipated or pending placements, uh, unanticipated placements. There are a lot of uh, uh, situations that aren't totally confirmed, but since the budget came out in terms of special ed. So that's good, there's a level of stability there. State funding is still uncertain. You've heard Liza speak about that many times. The Chapter 70 money, charter school tuition uh, support, uh, full day kindergarten grants, all of those things are up in the air. We probably got less information, not <coughs> more information, when we saw the governor's budget, and there's still a lot of questions going on there. Capital budget, um, we did get an initial uh, an amount um, recommended to be reduced from our capital budget request, but then there was a second request. Uh, actually, those of you who were watching uh, last, uh, last week, a week ago, Thursday, heard that. And uh, so we got another request from the Capital Outlay Committee to identify some uh, of the lower priority items so that another uh, cut could be made. They're meeting tonight. 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 Their committee is meeting tonight. So we may know some more after that, but it's, but it's not just the operating budget that is being reduced significantly, it's also going to be the capital budget. Vocational education, we have one new youngster, we're at the number that we have budgeted, so we're okay on that. And as I said earlier this evening, one of the biggest things is the enrollment count and the uncertainty about that. We said 300 kids because we had 300 kids this year, but honestly, if you look back at the graph of the enrollment for kindergarten, it has gone up and down and up and down, and we just need for it to stabilize so that we know how many teachers that we have. If we have a lot fewer than 300 students, there's a problem in that we have a lot fewer tuitions. On the other hand, a lot fewer than 300 might allow us to reduce a teacher, so then uh, reducing the number of, uh, of uh, sections uh, wouldn't be uh, a problem. Also concerned about grade one. We had to take a risk <laughs> this year in saying, how many youngsters are going to come from some other kindergarten to the Hingham grade one? And we don't know. We put in our budget, John, like two <coughs> or three in each building. Yeah, I think eight across the four Eight across the district. district was all we put in there for an extra allowance this year. And so what will happen with respect to class size if more youngsters uh, actually come? So we're getting started a little bit earlier, but uh, it'll be at least a month, if not more, 
uh, until we have a better sense of where K and 1 are going to end up and also where we will end up with respect to our, um, our revenue offset for kindergarten. So those are, some of those things are scary things. And uh, most of them are things we have no control over, but they add to the angst of the time of year. So our recommendation is very brief, that we should acknowledge the Education Subcommittee's target goal for the school department budget. We accept it. We understand it. We acknowledge it. We appreciate all the work that, uh, that you did and, um, and all of the figures that uh, have been generated um, to support it. And we understand that the goal is for a 4.8 percent increase um, over last year and that that figure can be arrived at by eliminating all of the new requests and an additional 341,000 and uh, um, we're, we're going to struggle with that. So I gave one scenario tonight for the 500 but I can tell you that what's left after that is about 460 more to get to that goal. That 460 is going to be hard to get to. And it may be that the only way we can get to it is to look at um, current services and some uh, changes there. Because getting to that uh, 500,000 that I just kind of roughly went over tonight was not easy. There's not much left in the, in the list of certainly the new requests, and so if we don't reduce the new requests, then we need to look at um, existing budget, base budget. Now, at the moment, the money for the, the bus bid is still in the budget. It's in the, the increment part is, in the, uh, is on the list of new initiatives. That's still sitting there because we need more time to think about that and to uh, assess where we're going. And at the moment, the reading adoption, which was been in the base budget anyway, is still there because there's been some talk, and most of you have heard it, about is there a better way to deal with that kind of a one-time thing. Every 10 or 11 years, we uh, do a major adoption. At the elementary level, it is a major adoption. We have over 2,000 youngsters uh, that will be impacted by that. So those two things are still in the budget, as uh, I described the reduction to get to where we are tonight. So we accept the goal and understand it, and uh, we'll continue to, to, to work on that. Uh, we ask you to accept our caution um, with respect to the number of unknowns that, re that remain. And we ask you uh, to allow time to continue discussion about the transportation lease and the reading adoption and to allow for news of other personnel changes. There still are a fair number of teachers in the original 12, I think five total, that have told us nothing about what their plans are. Um, and that, of course, will change over the next week, but that's a fair number uh, of folks. We also um, ask that you uh, allow time to absorb the impact of the scope of the kinds of the new reductions that I'm suggesting this evening. They're not things that would be just nice to have. They're things that we're counting on that meet a need and we need either to find new ways to meet the need uh, that aren't as costly or we need to uh, adjust to the idea of having to live with significantly uh, less. <coughs> And those are reductions that are onerous and only still get us to a 5.78 percent increase and not to the 4.8 where um, we're supposed to be going. And I also would ask that you consider, you need some time and we all need some time to consider alternatives. What alternatives to cuts in services there are? And, you know, we always look at things like, well, can't we take more out of a revolving account? Can't we add to fees? Well, 20000 for 800 students, um, that's, that's a hard way to get to another 1% of our budget. Um, we spent hours and hours and hours over the last three years establishing fees for rental of our, our buildings and grounds. And it's not a big generator of revenue. So we can look at those things, but those are not the things that are going to make the biggest uh, differences in getting to where we need to be. So 
we have a recommendation. And here it is. That you act this evening to an adopt an FY17 school department operating budget of the 4802448, which is an increase of 5.75%, because we need time. This decision to get another percent off this budget is going to have big time impact, and we need time to do that in the best possible way. Um, and so, simple recommendation. Um, it's a number. Know that um, in that 500,000, there are very specific recommendations, and I'll share that uh, my thinking with you on that. You can all weigh in. Certainly, as I um, looked at those things, I had written down um, some pretty good notes of what you all said last week, and obviously we can't make everybody happy on everything, but the bottom line is when most everything has to go, uh, Nobody's happy in the in the end, but I think there's some pretty good consensus that we had on some of those uh, some of those things. So, well, Dr. Gallo, that is the recommendation. You. Thank you very much for all this. First of all, Jim, did all your group get one of these handouts? No, I don't believe so. Let me just make sure you guys have them real quick. <coughs> Actually, everybody can have one of those. Okay. <coughs> Before I start, discussion. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, first things first. First of all, Dr. Gal, I very much liked your approach on this. I, and the reason why I stress I like her approach is as anyone who went to town forum, we gave a, a quick synopsis of the magnitude of the school system. Not only do we have over 300 FTE teachers, we have almost 150 paraprofessionals. We have a lot of people, a lot of moving pieces. And with some of our contracts where people don't have to give us notifications to March 1st, there's a lot evolving. So I sort of like the fact that she was trying to look at different scenarios without going to the specifics and give us some numbers there. Uh, second thing is, is I know that the AESC would like to, this to come in at 4.8. We're down to 5.75. I think it's a very good attempt. Uh, we heard you. We're making efforts on that. Um, why we mentioned you guys there just for everyone here to be aware, tomorrow at 6.30 p.m., the Advisory Committee, Educational Subcommittee, will be meeting at 6.30 and voting. And then at 7.45, they're going to be presenting their dis discussion, decision, to the full ADCOM for a full vote on Thursday. Three other quick points that I just want to make sure everyone's, and I'm going to turn it over to you guys, the task at hand. The first task at hand is that the Advisory Educational Subcommittee gave us a target of a 4.8% increase from last year and possibly even going lower than that. We were at 6.8 last week. We've come down to 5.75. We are still working at getting other things, but the task at hand is to work on that number here. There's two secondary issues that we've all discussed about and heard. One is an issue of a structural problem about the school committee or the school budget growing at, at X lengths. And I know Liza has been talking about a five-year plan. That's something that we can't accomplish today, but we have to work on. And I think another thing, a part B of that, is how we socialize issues. Dr. Gallo has always stressed the word needs, and I think people have to understand what it ne means, the word needs, when you think about a premier school system. What do we want out of it? Um, so those, again, those are two issues that are not prominent tonight, because the first thing is get in the number, and obviously the recommendation is from the school committee. But I just want to recap some of that. So on that note, um, and of course, mainly, I would stress and encourage everyone on the committee to sit down with Dr. Gallo, John, Ellen, either collectively, not more than three of you, um, or individually, to go over some brainstorming ideas that you may have. On that note, does anybody have any comments or questions for Dr. Gallo? Yes. I have a quick question. Uh, the tuitions for the um other schools being set is there a date that um, you know the collaborative and, and other schools are um, usually set there to varies a lot there's not a deadline date for example our collaborative will vote its budget and that includes the new rates at our le next meeting and that isn't coming up for a while Th they meet only six times a year and um, so I don't think that Ellen has heard of from any of the schools yet and we have a three percent increase in there 
It varies. Okay. It, it, because it usually happens at board meetings and they all have different board meetings uh, during the year. So um, actually March 4th is the board meeting for South Shore. But South Shore Collaborative has only maybe 20 something of our students. So um, a percent of an increase of uh, there of 2% or 25 rather than three would save us a little money, but okay. it isn't a big, uh, a big amount. And we actually are fortunate that we don't have any students at the handful of schools who are uh, looking for really big increases. So that's a good thing. Ray, Carol. I, I have several questions. Yeah, sure. So where are we on making some decision on how we're going to approach the reading program? <coughs> Is there any update on that? There's not from, you know, we, we heard some talk about that uh, last Thursday morning at ADCOM as an idea that had come up. We had talked right. about it at our meeting on the 11th, as well at the forecast meeting. There was some talk uh, about different ways to handle some of those things and, and what ability there was to use um, um, the, the capital, because the capital budget is separately voted and yet much of the capital revenue comes out of the operating so, budget. Okay, so. so but somebody, it's going to be up to us to ask. It, there was um, also in that forecast meeting. Um, and that forecast, by the way, is in your uh, packet. There was some discussion about that. There's a, a couple of these one-time items in the full town budget, and that potentially for this year's budget, there's some savings that they know are anticipated on the town side. And then the idea of the, the FEMA money was touched on, but that's complicated. And so um, Tom Piles mentioned, you know, there's a couple of these one-time payments mm -hmm. out there, but there was no conclusion drawn. Um, so but who, it's, who it was that? floated Is that out Ted? There. Is that the selectmen? Who? Is that the advisory? Who do you guys know? Who makes that decision about a one-time payment like that? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, Jim is going up there. Uh, one other thing that came out at advisory mm -hmm. was that at, uh, at uh, the forecast meeting is that there's some really significant savings in three accounts in the FY16 budget. So there was awesome to chatter about taking that several hundred thousand dollars and seeing whether or not that was a way to ease up some operating money um, by using it for one-time one kinds mm -hmm. of expenditures. But they, they did caution that the snow budget is already over budget, so even though we've had a light really? winter, so <laughs> just to, just putting it cool. all on the table. <laughs> but we did but, that in but We did ask them all specifically, could we use some of this one-time money for like the the books and everything. Right. So, Jim, uh, Jim Taylor, uh, vice chair of the advisory committee, and I'm the education subcommittee. And I'd much rather be talking about education than budgets, frankly, because <laughs> I'm been consumed with budgets for the last few weeks. So, uh, just for the public at home to know, you know, we have a regular forecast meeting, which is essentially we determine the town determines kind of how our revenue and expenses are looking for next year. Um, as a town, we need to present a balanced budget. And as it stood last uh, Thursday night, which is four or five days ago, uh, we okay. sat at a $2.6 million deficit. So our expenses succeed our revenue, projected revenue by $2.6 million, which frankly is a high amount to be out of balance at, at this late stage in the process. Um, and that's really precipitating the need to have these really difficult decisions, not only in discussions, not only with the the school department, but also on the municipal side. Um, and to really look for every possible savings that we can find within the town uh, and, uh, to um, deliver the services that the townspeople expect. So, you know, we're working really hard on trying to find a path to get to a balanced budget. And that's what our task has been, the advisory committee's task has been, the town administrator's task has been, all the departments, yourself included, uh, are going to have to make some difficult decisions. Um, as it relates to some issues, some specific issues that you have, um, those are items that um, uh, I know I'm very well aware of and it's an issue that we need to discuss. Is there other possible ways to fund 
one-off kind of requests like mm -hmm. a very important um, service like the the reading program are there ways that we can be creative in terms of funding these kinds of endeavors I don't I can't give you an answer for that right now I'll have an answer for you by Thursday because we actually have to have a balanced budget by Thursday uh, or at least be on the path to a balanced budget by Thursday um, but those are items that you've certainly I've heard I know the selectmen have heard um, Ted has heard um, as a serious serious issue and everything will be on the table uh, we're trying to be as creative as possible to balance this budget and that includes things like you know pushing up you know possibly pushing up capital expenditures to fiscal year 2016 because we do have uh, projected to have an excess of around a little over three hundred thousand dollars in 2016 um, things like FEMA money we know we're going to get reimbursed at some point um, but you have to remember there's a lot of people that are looking sure. for access to right. whatever revenue including ourselves we have a 2.6 million dollar deficit to, to somehow um, to find a way to, to solve so this is on the table I know you know we bring your concerns to the table uh, I'm well versed um, you know we're constantly talking and discussing about creative ways to to to, to balance the budget um, and the reading program is certainly on our list of those top items to talk about those are the types of things that factor into I think some decision making on like if I'm taking a vote on a budget I guess <coughs> I was hoping to know yes this is at the top <coughs> of a list for us to consider out of 16 money or whatnot so it's it's hard to to kind of weigh in yeah when I feel like it's like this everything there's so many variables up in the there's air there's a so lot you, of balls in the air so right you now. know we we are I think as a committee would like that reading program you you've you've made it very clear to, to to us in an, the importance of that way. program number one and then the funding to look at alternative methods of funding whether it by right. through capital or other means because you can make an argument that it's a capital expense, not just a budget expense. Mm -hmm. right. And it is a, you have it spread over two years. Um, um, but I can't guarantee we're going to find an easy solution. And I know that we're all going to have to make some difficult decisions when, when it comes down to it. But that is absolutely okay. Just so on we're the table. all clear that it's that's on the, table. on the table and that's a request. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Sure. Do you have other questions for I, him to stay up there? I no, not for Jim. <laughs> so I, I, I mean, I, I do have some other questions about. Um, so one thing in thinking about these cuts, we kind of get into the regular education and the special education impact. And and <coughs> our hands, I mean, we're we're required under law to provide special education and, and the expenses related to that. I, I'm a little concerned that the regular education side of the budget is going to take a disproportionate hit and that's that's a concern right. so I don't know in this number that you're recommending I, I don't know how that impacts regular education because I know special education is going to be covered well that no that's not exactly okay. true that the, the required functions for students and services are going to be covered uh, we're not taking anything out of tuitions but there were two new positions that were in mm -hmm. the regular of uh, the um, the list of the seven whatever it was 54. Uh, one is the um, the position for this office, and we reduced right. the cost of that. We're going to try to meet that need in a better way, a different way, at for thirty five thousand dollars and not for seventy. So that was reduced. The other position is a position that we wanted to put in place as part of the kindergarten thing last year and so um, that's on that list as well and virtually there's almost nothing left on that list quite honestly um, because if the determination of us getting to 4.8 and <coughs> getting rid of all of that or the equivalent that's a big equivalent to find in the regular ed budget but anyway those two things um, are one is reduced and the other is not there at the moment. Now, depending upon what happens with our enrollment, our kindergarten registration, and depending upon, uh, we're hoping to uh, collect the, the uh, amount of money that we actually collected last year, which was more than we had thought that we were going to collect. We can come back and look at that. Or maybe what we have to do, because it's an issue of fairness, because we have two schools who are sharing a spe special educator um, 
and we have two schools that are not. Um, and so maybe we're going to have to look at that one position and share it four ways. I don't know. We, we've got to do something. Those are the kinds of things that we have to do to lessen impact. But there's really no way to eliminate $760,000 worth of things and another 341. That's a million dollars. There's no way to eliminate a million dollars from the budget without attacking most of the things that you wanted to add into it. But at the point when we're at 6.85 percent, the special ed budget at that point was at 7 percent and the regular ed was at um, 6.49, was it where we were? And, and 6.8 was the whole thing. But as I'm looking at these, and that's why I say we have to take time, every single time we make a cut uh, or, or somebody takes a leave. So two of the leaves, the most recent leaves, came out of a special ed. So that budget went down even though we didn't have to cut anything from it. But I have to recalculate every time we do that to make sure that we're meeting all the obligations that we have there in terms of student services, but also that those are not impacting the regular ed. The good thing, at least to date, is that the special ed budget hasn't changed over this period of time, so that's healthy. And we do know that we have the, um, the account, should we have a new tuition that would come in after the budget's closed, we at least have some dollars in there, hoping to put another 100000 of course, in there. But that's a challenge to look at that, at that balance. My final comment is, although I applaud the creativity of trying to come up with some money in terms of fees, I, I'm absolutely opposed to putting this on the back of high school kids. Let's come up with a new fee to charge a different class of people because I just think the high school kids get hit with so many expenses and I personally would be opposed to that, just to share my thoughts on that. So I have a number of things. Uh, so, Jim, you can wait until if you want to take notes while I go. That might be helpful because I do have some questions because, frankly, I'm not ready to vote. I don't have enough information, and I'm looking to the three of you to help because, you know, there's a lot of unknowns. We're talking about uncertainties. You know, I'm, I'm hearing, you know, we're forecasting for a 10 percent increase in health insurance. And then I heard, oh, maybe it's not going to be as much, maybe 8, 9 percent. And then last week I heard it's supposed to be 14 percent. Well, I need detail on that. I need it from Ted. I go in to see Ted on Friday. He's not there. Okay? So that's disappointing because um, I had some questions and I was hoping to get some input and there was nobody there to, to answer any questions. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, looking at the forecast, and we've been talking about this for a few years, so people have been talking about a structural deficit. And the structural deficit is, is created because we do not include steps and lanes for the school department in the forecast. We've been talking about that for six years. Jack Manning got up and he took Ted to task for not including it five, six years ago because we weren't looking at real numbers. And so every year around this time, we're looking at a forecasted 2% increase and then we have to somehow figure out where the rest of it comes from. And it's a huge number for us. Now, I understand that the other side of town has steps and lanes as well, but they don't have as many, and they don't have the number of employees. So the sheer numbers just aren't the same. You look at our steps and lanes, it's, we're talking about six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000. It's not like that on the town side. So obviously, that's a huge number to have to try to squeeze in in February. Um, if we forecasted differently and looked at, you know, if the, if the forecast – 2% increase on a year-to-year -year basis, that was what was going to be assumed or dictated by Town Hall, you have to take at least a base average of what's a reasonable number to fit in because steps and lanes are, I mean, Alec is here, he's a president of the teachers union, okay? They are part of the system. We are not going to abolish that system today. You know, we are trying to work within that system as best we can. I think we made some great strides in the last contract negotiation moving from 14 to 13 steps and I think it benefits both sides and Alec is riding his head in agreement. Um, but without that number in there, and it's a huge number, I think it makes this task even more challenging. Um, you know, we're still carrying unused levy capacity of $500,000 in the forecast. Folks at home, a lot of folks don't understand what that means. Um, 
I don't necessarily want to get into the details of it. We, I think all of us here in the room, or most of us know what it is. It's something that we started just recently. And as it was explained to me, and I think Mary Parra was someone who mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, that is being used so that we're not taxing folks as much as we could in an effort to lower the burden as a result of the middle school project. That was specifically said a couple of weeks ago. And it may be for other reasons as well. Um, but if you look at the middle school project, it came in 4.5 million under budget, under the appropriation. So there was a savings right there. Also, the borrowing for that it was estimated to be 4% long-term borrowing. We borrowed, I think, notes at 19 basis points and then 11 basis points, and then we refinanced long-term debt, I think, at 2%, I think. Given that, there must be 4% was the number? 3%, I apologize, 3% long-term. So there's a 1% there's a savings long-term plus the savings from the short-term notes. You're a finance guy, I'm not, but I know that there's savings there that has to be realized. So I'd love to see a spreadsheet of kind of that, that calculation of the savings that was realized as a result of the middle school coming in under budget and the borrowing cost being less than was sold to the town in terms of what the cost of the project was going to be. So that's something else. The unused levy capacity is kind of a third way to give tax savings. And I'm all in favor of tax savings, <clears throat> but if we find ourselves giving kind of a tertiary level of tax savings for the same project at the expense of other items in the operating budget, then maybe we need to take a harder look at that and whether that's the most appropriate way to use the levy. Um, and again, these aren't things that are going to be answered tonight, but these are things that have been troubling me as I sat down with all of these notes and books and I went back to last year's budget and I looked at your spreadsheet that you know we worked on last year as well. And, um, you know, the numbers this year are a lot larger because I don't think we met our requirements for our um, contract obligations last year. And as a result, our numbers are much higher. And Doc can go into more detail about that maybe offline. Um, <clears throat> another suggestion I have, and I'm sure that you guys have been talking about this, is so we have uh, the, the latest fund balance memo, 23 point. 23% fund balance, which is 3%, three and three, almost three and a quarter over the high end of the threshold, which is 20%. Perhaps some of that money can be used for capital. And if it can be used for capital, then some of the capital that's in operating can come out and free up operating cash for other things. I'm sure this is something you're talking about already. So not a new suggestion, I hope, but it seems to me that this is an opportunity in the financial policy it says when there is excess capital above the threshold, it can be used for a number of things, one of which is capital expenditures. Um, I noticed in the capital budget, the proposed capital budget, which is now changing, obviously they're meeting tonight, but there's a total of $665,000 going to the library for roof and air handlers. I know they need it. We've been talking <coughs> about the roof at the library for years. And the air handlers as well, as you know, as someone who knows buildings in town, I know that these air handlers need to be replaced. We've had to replace them numerous times at East School, so I'm well aware of that. These are huge ticket items, 350, 275, whatever the numbers are. But a total of 665, it seems to me, it's almost too large to be in the capital budget. Should be a warrant item. It should be something that we're seeking to find to fund elsewhere, like we did with the fire trucks that were over a million dollars. 665 is a huge number to be coming out of, out of capital to the library, um, just as one, essentially two line items together. I look at them together as one item. Um, I just think maybe there's a better way to finance that um, that might free up additional money for operating. Um, because if we can use capital, get capital sources from other funds and then transfer it and use it for operating, you mentioned the possibility of excess money from fiscal 16, using it for, for capital. Um, that, you know, that would be another way. Um, you know, I think the way we're talking about, um, <clears throat> you know, finding a way to close the gap here, my concern is, and I wasn't at the uh, sub subcommittee meeting on Thursday. I couldn't, I couldn't be there. I couldn't call in. I was on another call at the same time. Um, but 4.8% increase, 
I have to imagine that we're going to, if we were to make that threshold, <coughs> we're going to have to make cuts to staff. Now, people use the term level services a lot. I think we have, or at least some of us have, a difference of opinion as to what level services means for the school department versus what it means for the rest of the town, just because of the size and scope, as Andy has mentioned, and the relative needs that we have that are different than the other side. Um, you know, I think, I think that uh, getting to 4.8% would be essentially a cut to level services in the school department. And I cannot imagine being asked to cut from level services as the town defines it when we have three and a quarter percent in excess of our fund balance threshold, we are still a triple A rated town. Um, we, you know, earn awards about our financial management and everyone wants to move here because of the schools. And I just cannot imagine that with all of the, um, you know, the smart, creative folks that, that, uh, uh, that Mrs. Rowan spoke about earlier in this town that we can't find another way to approach our budgeting and find a way to close this gap. I was astonished to look at the, the forecast, the new forecast, and see that the change from February 4th, two week change, the gap had actually gone up almost $200,000 when we had made cuts to our budget and it still went up. So I, I, I don't know how we're gonna get there and clearly it's gonna be on everyone's backs but it seems that it's gonna be on our backs more just because of the sheer size of our budget. And I, I don't think that that's a fair way to approach this, especially when we are in as good financial shape as we are. Um, you know, I think, um, I think it's important. I pulled, out, I pulled out a lot of materials when I was going through this budget this weekend. I pulled out our notes from our planning meeting in September and the spreadsheet that we did, and we all had the colors and what our priorities were and what we were looking for for the, this year. And there are things in there that I think all of us agreed for this year that we're thinking about maybe not moving forward with and for the next you know, three years not moving forward with because we might be forced to cut um, in a time when we shouldn't have to be forced to cut. Um, so I'm, I'm, really, I'm really at a loss. You know, with respect to you know specific um, suggestions that have been made, you know, Dot, Ellen, John, Liz, I applaud you for coming up with these recommendations. You know, I have to agree with Carol on the fees. Twenty thousand dollars seems like it will help, um, but frankly, you know, Andy, uh, a number of years ago, you know, made the statement that you know what, an approach to fees should be a regular look at at fees, a looking at look at costs, and we raise things on a regular uh, regular intervals, um, and it makes sense to do that, uh, particularly when you look at costs rising uh, at an incremental level over the same period of time. I don't think that we should be looking to fund our budget at this point by raising fees on just high school parents. Everyone else in town should be paying for these public schools not just high school parents. It's not just 1,200, the parents of 1,200 kids or so that should be paying to support this budget. It should be everybody in town sharing. So I think that's a disproportionate way to find small dollars um, in a cut, and I, and I would not support it. I would support it if we looked at it in the normal course, the way we do with fee increases, and say, hey, we haven't raised uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, athletic fee at the high school in a couple of years. It's something we should look at. Um, costs are rising and we have to keep up with the incre incre incremental increase. Um, but we didn't do that. And if we, you know, the school committee wants to do that next year, I think that's a good idea. I don't think that doing it as a knee-jerk reaction to find more dollars in the budget makes sense. I think it's just an unfair way um, to find dollars. Um, The last thing I would say is, um, you know, I said I, I didn't have enough information, um, and I still don't feel like I do. Um, I know that last year we voted, and then we came back and re-voted our budget on March 30th. Um, I also know that advisory, I don't think, voted budgets, or at least the school budget, until March 9th 
of last year. Town meeting was April 27th. So this year we're being asked to vote budgets essentially two weeks in advance when town meeting is only two days earlier. Um, so I guess my question is why are we rushing to do this? We have a March 1st time period where we'll get more concrete information about leaves of absences um, and next year's dollars. Um, another week or so will maybe give us more insight into the health insurance, more concrete information, because I understood it wasn't completely concrete, and maybe it's not the 14% increase, but a little bit less than that. I don't know. Um, but I just think we vote this week, and I mean we, I mean selectmen, I mean advisory, then we're, we're, almost, we're almost giving in to the reality that we're not going to work harder to find a way to pay for these things with with the money I know that we can find um, I don't I, I really don't believe this forecast um, and I need more backup um, to explain it to me because you know and I've sat in that forecast room many many times and I've listened to Ted and his explanations and I can't imagine explanations uh, for this forecast so I would implore the advisory committee to think about postponing its vote um, at least a few days. I just think everybody needs more time. There's still many uncertainties, a lot of things in flux. We can get greater information and greater insight into things that could better inform us um, so we don't have to come back and redo these votes um, or perhaps make cuts when we don't need to make cuts. That would be my comment. Dr. Ed, did you have anything? Liz? Thank you. Um, I will just say um, thank you to Dr. Gallo and Ellen and John for, you know, making some very difficult cuts on the proposal. Um, I understand that, you know, what the we're all in a bind. I mean, it's a it's a budget to plan, and is there ever a magic date of when to vote? Um, and you know, we have to get to somewhere. And I think this is, you know, we're doing our part of getting there. And I, I agree we, you know, it would be better to have more time so that we can get a little more focused and that everyone on the, the full town can look a little bit closer at all the issues that we're all juggling with to manage priorities. Um, and I, I think you know, we do have to start thinking about the future and what is, what's sustainable and where are we going. And, and we have the issues from the state, too, of whether we're going to get Chapter 70 money or not. Um, that's still out there. Um, but I would say, you know, the advisory committee was great in helping us looking to the future and five years out, making some projections. I think we need to do that on the town side too and and all work as a team to start understanding five years out what are all the projects we have going on and do they come in out of the operating budget or are there other resources are we borrowing and and what are the priorities when are we going to do things at different times um, because yeah that has made an impact on this year's operating budget um, so I would hope we can all work as a team to look at, even look at ways of operating more efficiently together. Um, but I would say that, you know, this proposal I can I can accept this as a, it's a step in the right direction. It's not something we want to do. <coughs> um, but there is a, a reality of the pie is only so big with the information we have today so um thank you Liza. yes I, yeah yeah because you you people go first i let them speak again <laughs> uh newbie question and my apologies if it's a dumb one but why do we have to vote tonight there are no dumb questions <laughs> well i can't be the only one wondering but is there a reason that we need to vote before well. not not that i want to put it on every someone else but you know, as as last year, the <coughs> committee voted, then advisory voted, 
then the school committee went back and re-voted. We've done that actually the last couple of years. Okay. Every year, so six years. So why do we take the first vote then? We don't have to. Yeah, so we don't have to. Okay. So up until now, this budget has been proposed by the administration. We don't have a budget. Everyone's been listening and waiting, and now it's our opportunity to weigh in, and we've started to weigh in you know, over time, but now is the time where this budget becomes the school committee's budget. And at that point, then the selectmen and advisory can take it up in earnest and say, okay, based on this, this is what we are gonna recommend. In the last couple of years, um, you know, we've come back, there have been discussions after our vote, after that uh, uh, vote of selectmen and advisory, and there have been more savings found. Um, there have been discussions with folks in advisory and, and the selectmen to find a way to kind of get to yes and get comfortable with us changing mm -hmm. our vote. Last year it was only $150,000. Right. That was a small ask. It wasn't a million or a million and a half. Well, I guess my point is all the information's out there. Yep. I mean, you know, the, the people who are making the decision, the advisory committee, the selectmen all know, as Jim very kindly put it, you know, he's gotten the message. So, you know, is there some box we have to tick tonight to make it official so that they can do their job? Or can we wait until, as you said, Ray, we have more information? Well, and what's the longest we can wait? You know? Well, we, we, can, we can wait till town meeting. And frankly, we can go to town meeting and support a different budget altogether if we wanted to. And we've talked right. about that, that in the past. And that would have its own issues, yeah. Sure, right. it yeah. would. But town meeting can vote a budget, whether right. advisory recommends it or doesn't recommend it. Um, you know, generally, town meeting is going to support a budget that its advisory committee recommends because it trusts in its advisory right. committee. And that's why we have um, the advisory committee. Exactly. Um, but, you know, there ha I think there have been times in the past where there's been a difference. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I want to have a difference. I'm just asking no, why we, right. why I'm being asked to vote on something when I don't have the full information that I could have if we waited. You know, is there mm -hmm. some administrative thing that needs to be checked off? And if the answer is no, then no. I would agree that I need more information. What I would feel more comfortable about is having a, and it's really the question you ask, Carol, is so there are these, these ideas that are swirling around, and that's terrific that people are thinking, ah, oh, there's some access this year, maybe we could. But mm -hmm. what is the timeline for that, and, and like who's going to make that? That, that uh, affects then right. my decision. I mean, so right. I was just going to throw out, Andy, if if the consensus was that we did want to vote, we I maybe want to vote a different number than what, because of the reading program, I might want to gross this number up by the reading program until I get some feedback. The reading program's, reading program's in there. Reading program is in there. Reading program oh, that's right. is in that number. That's right. right reading right. program okay. and bus lease are yeah, in there. Right. Well, yeah, the 200,000. Yeah. 200, yeah. Step one. Mm -hmm. The, um, yeah, so. Yeah. I'm you ask a good question. You know, sometimes people get used to tradition. Yep. The six years I've been on the committee, we've always voted a budget. It's gone to the good people back there, Jim and his group. They've tried to judge everything, which is a great system. Of, great thing about Hingham, there's a lot of checks and balances between us, the advisory board of selectmen. And then they come back and we've made the number work. Um, I think it is good, as you know, Ray alluded to, this is now our budget, it's not the administration budget. So I think it is good to set a tone. I mean, obviously, as I talked about, mm -hmm. when I think about the five-year plan and socializing needs and wants and what of a premier school system, those are things that we're not gonna accomplish tonight. And Ray and uh, Carol alluded to a lot of those. We do have to come to something on uh, numbers because regardless, we have town meeting in less than 60 days. I would say two things though, I would say two things. Jim, and we talked about this at one of your advisory educational subcommittee, it's, it's, getting, it's weird, it's a mixed signal because we, we talk about how we have this 23% fund balance reserves, yet when we went in front of the Board of Selectmen for our windows at PRS, they were like, well, how are we going to pay for this? And, you know, it's, I, I can understand they're talking about no new growth in town. And they've, you know, because there's not building projects in the in the ground, so it's hard to to do that. And we've seen the forecast; they've taken it down from 800,000 to like 300,000 or whatever. 
But it, it's sort of a, it's a weird message because you have all this money in the bank and it's above. So, you know, I, I, it's sort of, you're, you're predicting this very dark, you know, outlook for everything where I don't, you know, it just, I don't know, it's just one of those tough things for me to completely grasp when you do, when you're at 23%. If we were at 12%, I'd be a little bit more concerned, but at 23%, yeah, maybe some things. Uh, some things that also I don't want to pick on the fine work capital outlay has done, but you know, the purpose of the town forum was to talk about big capital projects. Some of those things that are being approved or been recommended were not discussed at town forum. Which how did those all of a sudden jump to the top of the line when PRS, for example, I I voted for it three years ago, two years ago, all the time to vote for it. So. That's just one of those things. But so just for when you guys your, do your discussion, one thing that's confusing to me, and I always love transparency, is always tell both sides of the story. The fact is we do have a 23% fund balance. What is the goal? Are we going to raise that to 25% or when is it, it good to be in the range of 15 to 20%? So that's one thing. Um, and I have a note here which I don't understand. Oh, I know. Uh, gap up, not down. This is the first time I remember this late in the game receiving a forecast report where the gap went up, mm -hmm. not down. Yeah. Um, Ray alluded to that. So that was a little disheartening because it we're trying. went up about the amount that we had cut. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that went up more. So it was like yeah, that. so that was the one thing there. But Dr. Gell, just to wrap this up, your recommendation is to do nothing on the bus bid tonight. And your recommendation is to act to adopt a, in a fiscal 17 school budget of this 40 ma 48 million odd. All right. right. And on I that know we can get to that number, but there's leeway in there, and I would share right. the specifics that I think are a way to get there with you. And there's wiggle room to be able to get to that number. It's not right. pleasant, and it's essentially so as chair everything of the school that's in that list of <clears throat> things that we needed. But if the goal is the 4.8. That was a million dollar cut for yes. us and the 3.1. There's so, no other way to get there but removing either those things or some other things that are in the base budget. So I will make a motion to adopt a fiscal 17 school department operating budget of 48 million oh two four 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 eight. Do I have a second? Second. Do I have discussion? I have a question. Yes. What amount for the bus lease is in here? The increment of one. The, increment, the bus lease money is still in there. One nineteen, I think it is in the new request. That's one yeah. of the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and and the rest of it is of course in the mm -hmm. base I'm, budget. I'm kind of like I I, I feel similar to Cynthia and I I'm not sure I'm I feel prepared to vote on this tonight. Dr. Gallo, do you need us to vote? Like, is there I don't personally need you to vote, no. Okay. No. Okay. Any more discussion? Sure. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Opposed. No. For time. Okay. All right. So we do not have a budget, which is fine. Um, <laughs> moving on. We have, we have our meeting tomorrow at 630 and then at 745. Um, Moving on to seven point, excuse me. Yes. Sure, go. Yes, Jim. I just want to follow up on, um, and I understand and appreciate where you're at in the budget, that we're <laughs> frustrated as you are as well. I just want to make a very quick point about the fund balance, and it's um, um, actually two points. Um, one that Ray brought up, um, I want to make sure that's understanding here the, under, uh, the, the, the unused levy capacity is essentially financed by the meals tax revenue. So when we, when the town introduced the meals tax, which is a tax that everyone that dines in Hingham pays at a restaurant, there was an assurance that that wouldn't be used to effectively fund operating expenses within the town. It wasn't going to be used to make it appear like it was a higher tax. So effectively, meals tax revenue is what's funding that unused levy capacity. So you're lowering the tax rate for the taxpayer, and the funding mechanism is the meals tax revenue. Okay, so that was that was how it was sold, and that's why it's been used in that way. 
Um, the Can second I just ask you a question on that? Yeah. Just on that point? Yeah. So I understand that. I completely agree. But then why do we turn it into a local receipt? Because if you turn it into a local receipt, which it now is, yes. it no longer has to go through stabilization and then out of stabilization right. to be applied. So right. now it could be by any future board it could be. used for operating in exactly the way they intended it not to be. Uh, theoretically, it could be used from, yes. Right. So the current board of selectmen, the current advisory, has decided to use that meals tax money as from a local receipt as part of the unused levy, levy capacity. You just so it was promised to the taxpayer, correct. Right. Right. Okay. Um, and then secondly, about the fund balance, which is at 23%. Remember, a couple things. First is, that's that's been built up over the years through a number of different sources. The major being is that um, um, folks, the budgets in town haven't been fully spent, so we've been able to take the excess. The school committee has been a big contributor to that, I think a little over 30%. Um, has been added to our levy capacity and built that up over a fairly short period of time. So sure, it's at 23%. There won't be an unused amount that will be contributed this year from fiscal year 2016. We're going to try to use that for to accelerate some projects in town. You also know that the measurement of that is based on um, the, um, the, this is the numerator or the denominator. The numerator will always rise. Help me out, please. Um, <laughs> the, the top <laughs> number, yeah. So whichever it is, the top <coughs> or the bottom number, the numerator denominator, at least in other words, um, will increase every year. So the percentage is going to go down naturally every year. Then thirdly, there's nine articles this year at town meeting that propose to spend from fund balance. So, you know, there is pressure. There's a lot of pressure in town, a lot of various projects in town that uh, have identified fund balance as a mechanism for funding. And um, the fund balance is not to be used for operating expenses. So I know there's some pressure there. So there's a reason why we targeted that range, because all AAA communities, uh, peer group in town in the state, we know, in fact, many of them have fund balance in, in excess of 20%. We know from the rating agencies that's the right place to be. And the cost of the town, if we were to have a lower rating, is significant. So that's why we strive to keep a AAA-rated community, because it's good for everybody in town. So I hope that's helped a little bit. No, that's, that's a great answer. And Andy, if I could, just, yeah. just one point, because you mentioned a lot of money in the fund balance over the last several years, and that's because of prudent fiscal management. And I'm a huge uh, yes. supporter of that, and I think it was terrifically done. And you played a big part in that, and, and, and I'm proud to say um, you know, that it's made us even stronger financially. It's over $12 million in the last three years, okay, because I have the fund balance memos here. Mm -hmm. um, my only concern is we look at these forecasts every year and Ted budgets very conservatively. You would agree? Yes. Okay. We look at these forecasts, we budget conservatively, and at the end of the year, there's money left, and it's usually a lot more than we thought there would be. And that money drops to the bottom <coughs> line in fund balance. Yes. And that's We've been a big benefactor of that reality, um, and that's a, you know, a reason why we are as strong financially as we are. My concern is here we are in a, in a year where they're looking at growth, they're a little bit concerned about yep. you know, how that's looking. As a result, we're getting real tight on operating when there are other sources mm -hmm. of funds and more imagination perhaps could be used, and my fear is that we're asked to cut, and perhaps even more than was suggested tonight that might impact our level of services only to find at the end of the year that there's a seven million, you know, a, a seven figure number that drops to the bottom line and we mm -hmm. didn't have to cut. Right. Well, I can tell you last year, two, fiscal year 16, we're projected to have a $300,000 budget excess. Right. Uh, and that's town wide, including the schools, um, which we are hopefully going to be able to still spend before the end of the fiscal year. Um, to the point that all the departments are being asked to cut this year or to, act, or to have no additions, the, the odds of fiscal 17 having the same excess as limited um, is one point. And it frustrates me. The last thing you want is this excess at the end of the year. I'd rather be much more, much more tight in our budgeting process. And, you know, the school department has been a significant contributor over the years. And, in fact, I believe it averages over $600,000 a year as the schools contributed back to the town. 
So I would suggest that there are areas that it, we all can be a little more tighter budget-wise. Um, the last point I want to make is that you'll see in the forecast the projected revenue growth year over year. So fiscal year 2016, this is town-wide, to fiscal year 2017 is a total of around $2.5 million. And if you heard us in the subcommittee, we talked about a potential targeted increase for the school department of 2.2 million, of a 2.5 million overall town increase. So I would suggest that we're not asking you to cut, maybe not, maybe we're asking you to grow not as significantly. So I think we all need to kind of be on, on target with that too. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Jim, thank you for everything. Thanks. So just for the advisory educational subcommittee, this concludes our budget discussion since we're going to see you tomorrow. If you want to leave, you can. <coughs> oh, you're not over. You're not rude. Right. A lot of meetings. <laughs> All right. Moving along. Um, unless you want to hear about our, our mobile vendor policy. <laughs> 6.4. To receive draft language for mobile vendor policy as proposed by the policy subcommittee, first <coughs> reading. Liza. Okay. Um, at the last meeting, <coughs> we had showed you um, that we had incorporated the mobile commercial vendors into the overall policy of 7.4 of use of school property by outside organizations. Um, tonight, we just want to present this one section as a first reading. Um, we talked about the other section regarding the quote unquote tailgating and recognized that we don't think we have to include that se second section as a standalone. And so we're going to make some revisions to the overall policy. So that's why, but we wanted to get this part of it, um, done tonight or get started on this part of it. Um, so we did receive some comments um, from Ray, and we incorporated those into this policy. And um, basically for those at home, um, there are numerous ice cream truck vendors, hot dog vendors, flower sellers that um, come onto the properties, um, mostly on the weekends, but uh, occasionally um, at other during sports events or potentially graduation. I wanted to make sure that um, where and when they were selling um, was at an appropriate time and that there was safety for um, the parking lots and spectators and students. Um, and so that's why we came up with this policy. Um, so the mobile vendors or peddlers would have to be licensed or permitted by the town of Hingham through the Board of Health or the Board of Selectmen. And then we're asking them to only do sales um, outside of school hours um, and in the far park, farthest parking lots away from the school buildings. Um, and then some in locations in the parking lots that they would be um, parked so that their window is not positioned in the public way and that they would be out of the ingress and egress of the parking lots um, and that during school sponsored events they would have to have permission from the school principal um, to be on site during that time. They'd have to remove all their trash and recycling and may not deposit it on school property or in the school dumpsters. Um, and um, that um, you know, we would, the school committee would reserve the right to not allow the vendor if they're violating these policies. Um, we did get some feedback from uh, Paula Gerard McCann and from Margaret Conady, and they both felt that this covered their needs. So, Cynthia, do you have something else I was to just add? Reading this over, oh. and I realized that I think we neglected right. to. You're right. include Carol's point I from a while ago yeah. um, and we had been talking about that about mm. appropriate logos. Um, oh yeah. The, um, is there something else? 
No, no, mm -hmm. I was just going to ask about the softball. Did we ever resolve, I talked to Paula about the, the placement of the softball field and the truck that I know I've seen mm -hmm. there, which is not in the far parking lot? No, we did not. Okay. I neglected that. Well, that's so. fine. Okay. So just the first reading. We will, yep, it is the first reading. That's why we do this. Um, so I got those two notes of the, um, and one of the things we had discussed at an earlier meeting, as Cynthia alluded to, was um, some of the vendors have signage that may not be considered family friendly always, and so um, wanted to incorporate that, that they provide temporary signage when they're on school property um, to be appropriate. So. <laughs> um, and, and I have had a conversation with that vendor, and they were very happy to oblige to that request. So that shouldn't be an issue if we incorporate it into the policy. So Any questions? Um, we're voting May 14th on this? Sure. Yeah. So I just noticed, so they, this, they don't require any permission from the schools with this policy. There's no permitting or anything like that that they would need to come onto our property, right? During a, if it's during a school sponsored event, Only they would have event. to have permission. Um, but, and then they're restricted by, they must, any sales would be conducted outside of school hours and not within a half an hour before or half an hour after mm -hmm. school at each school. Yeah, we had but, discussed last year when this yeah. came up, but having, in addition to whatever might be necessary from the Board of Health or the selectmen, to have the school department issue a seasonal permit and have them pay like a seat one time so they actually be be um, you know permitted by the school department so we would know that they have right I just want to confirm that this doesn't it doesn't, doesn't require no it that, doesn't right? because we, we talked that about that would yeah. become too onerous to uh -huh. and we wanted right. to see how this would go um, because right. most of the you know, we have the list of vendors that are permitted by the town, and most of them, we know right. them, and they're there on the weekends primarily for the youth sports. Um, but then this provides more protection of, say, during graduation or when, you know, homecoming or the big events when there are big crowds. Um, right. When, that when was it came intent. up the first I'm time, thinking, the issue was not. Even if it's not money to register, I'm, right. you know, I'm just thinking we should know that they intend to do that right. because they're on our property. But but the issue was, remember when we talked about it the first time, the issue wasn't just, you know, the parking, the drives, the <coughs> logistics, but it was also the fact that they're on our property making money. Normally when you go to someone's property and you sell something, the place you go gets paid something because it's a for-profit business if it was you know if it's like you know HEF or HSP or whatever it is those are nonprofits we understand they're not out to make a dollar but for for-profit vendors they come to our property and they're making a profit and we don't get anything so that, that that's one of the things we had discussed last year right and that's, that's a reason yeah. why the theory of charging them like a seasonal very nominal charge right and then I guess we also had conversations where we didn't want to dissuade anybody from doing it because we right. didn't know if it was a service to the community yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm just thinking in the sense of they they do have to register with the Board of Selectmen and they have to the pay a fee to with the them town. but yeah. it's almost like they should at least make themselves known to the school department that they intend to go there whether it be for a fee or not yeah, I would yeah. That, yeah. That's all. Just, just so knowing who's on our property, right? Because, because in the event that they do something that we're not in favor of, I would like that any school department official or principal or whatnot could say, "You need to remove right. yourself from this property right now." Right. I mean, the fact, the fact you is, know, if they're not, if they're not somehow permitted by the school department, whether it's for a fee or not a fee. Just a even if be, it's a right. registration or if something, if, sure. If we don't have some sort of formal oversight, then, you know, they're not going to have, you, you can give them a copy. I mean, where do you, how do you give them a copy of the policy? Well, we want to give them a copy. And when they register with the Board of Health, we would have, we Well, the Board we of Health has their this stuff, but I mean, yeah. But they said they would attach this to the. Yeah. 
register with us anyways just just so that, just so that we have new knowledge that they may be coming onto right. our property and that it's more i think <clears throat> Because I'm not concerned about the money. I don't want to dissuade anybody from yeah. doing right. it. However, yeah. should something go wrong, if I go up and say, you need to remove yourself right. from the property, and they look at me, you know, who the hell are you? You know, this is, the school committee says this, you know. Uh, so all right, we'll, we'll, that, that's we'll all, that's talk all about it. Sure. Okay. So make some modifications, and I guess we could still well, make We'll see if we're ready to vote do a second reading or mm -hmm. vote okay. at the next one. Uh, Good. Is a curry check involved in any, in any spot? Um, I believe at the Board of Health when they register. Those. You think it's the Board of Health? They have to be permitted with, um, I'll, ch I'll double check that, but. I think Board of Health does require a curry check of some vendors. Yeah. I don't know that it's all vendors though, right? It's certainly ice well, cream vendors. Well, this is this their food vendor yeah. registration, okay. so I would assume that, that but I'll, Double yeah. check that. Yeah. Nice work policy. Um, 6.5, to discuss proposed language for resolution in support of the Suburban Coalition's request for additional state budget funding for education and act as appropriate. Liza. Okay. Uh, get my notes. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, as you are all aware, um, Dr. Gallo had forwarded us the information from the Suburban Coalition um, seeking for support for a resolution regarding the Chapter 70 funding as proposed by the governor. And um, we talked at our last meeting about the draft that was presented by the Suburban Coalition, and they were requesting that we made uh, make some edits to it. Um, there was general consensus that the uh, good people were open to the idea of um, supporting such a res resolution. And um, just for those at home and in the audience, why would this resolution be so important? Um, the governor's budget for fiscal 17 um, increases Chapter 70 funding, which is state aid for education, by only 1.6%. Um, it does nothing to recognize the findings of the recent Foundation Budget Review Commission regarding systemic underfunding of the Foundation Budget in the areas of special education and employee health insurance, two particular areas that they identified. Um, the estimated amount of this underfunding is approximately $2 billion statewide. Uh, Hingham has seen the impact of special education costs rising for many years um, recently, and this year in particular, a profound impact on the health care costs are affecting our operating budget. Um, while the bu governor's budget seems to honor the commitment to share revenue growth with municipalities by increasing unrestricted general government aid by 4.6 percent, it ignores the fact that for most communities, a large portion of local aid comes from Chapter 70. Um, the issue of underfunding affects every aspect of municipal operations. And when Chapter 70 aid is inadequate, municipalities must depend on the local property tax to make up the difference. Um, for reference, um, since um, fiscal year, from fiscal year 01 to fiscal year 16, the average Chapter 70 increase had been 5.2%. Um, for fiscal 14 to fiscal 17, the average increase of Chapter 70 was only 2.2%, whereas um, our budgets have been increasing on average over that time period, or the longer time period, 4.53%. And that doesn't even include the additional requests that we were made that didn't get covered in those um, each of those years. So. Um, in the past, you know, the average of Chapter 70 increase was 5.2 percent, but our budgets, um, so you, you get the gist of as expenses go up, um, state hasn't been holding their own. So um, the resolution is, I won't, it's up on the screen, I won't read the whole thing, but I'll cover, um, I 
cut out a couple sections that people had requested, lightening this up, but keeping the, the gist of it the same of that, you know, we're requesting um, to the legislature and the governor to begin to fully fund and adopt the recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review <coughs> Commission um, and further funding Chapter 70 allocations. So, so. do you make a motion and we'll second it to submit this to the solution? Yeah, so Board. I would uh, make a motion that the Hingham School Committee um, supports the resolution as written for calling on full funding of the Foundation Budget Review Commission's recommendations as stated. Do you have a second? I'll second. Good. Any other comments? Well, I just have one comment, and I'm sorry to be raising with this issue. So I, I, I'm supportive of it. This is the last sentence mm -hmm. of the last paragraph. The link can then easily be made between higher paid individuals and less reliance on various forms of government assistance as well as lower rates of crime. I personally don't feel comfortable with that being included. I think that's a bit of a subjective statement. Um, I don't know how the people feel about it right there. I would vote for it if we take it out, but if other people like it in. I would agree just because we took out. Yeah, we took the other sub right. more yeah, it, subjective. It's a corollary, statements. exactly. It's a bit right. of a so, yeah. Sociological right. bent on things. It's just rhetoric. Yeah. It's just. Yeah, I. Yeah. yeah. Less is better. I, I would. I would agree with that okay. change. Good. All in favor? Aye. Do you Aye. have a question? Oh. Quickly, oh. Cindy. I do, but it relates to how this will be used. So that might be for after we vote. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None carries thank you very much for Good, work. thank you um so can i can i just make a comment yeah. though? It <coughs> is, um, in, a, in the packet we have a letter from the suburban coalition that lists what's it seven schools mm -hmm. i think dot said that have passed this um since we made you know thoughtful changes to what they suggested i would hate to see us just sort of thrown on that list and because it's different yeah it's different yep. so I'm not sure how we can how we can promote it. <laughs> well, how we can tell that suburban coalition that we don't just want to be thrown <coughs> on that list. Yeah. When we um, write to Dorothy Presser, we'll tell her that this okay. is our version. Yeah. But we have our own resolution. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I Thank did you. speak to her on the phone um, before we even took this on to see whether or not they'd accept an alternate, and she said absolutely they would. But so we might want to contact her again and simply say, you know, we think we have something that's supportive of the overall idea here, um, and um, perhaps they could have uh, a, a press release if they have one that said uh, a number of school districts have adopted related resolutions or something yeah. that would suggest that we didn't all adopt the same thing, and perhaps some of those seven did as well. But I can call her, or you, or yeah. you can call her. Uh, well, thank you. Know. Thank you. Um, so I would imagine it sending this to our legislators and also sharing it with the Board of Selectmen and asking for their um, similar support um, and you know, just even to make the Selectmen aware that this is a concern of ours. Wonderful. 6.6, uh, 6.7 6 to receive notification of an overnight field trip of the high school student council to Hyannis for the MASC conference on March 11th, March 9th through the 11th, 2016. 6.7, to receive notification of an overnight field trip of the high school quiz bowl to the National History Bowl and be in Washington, in Washington DC on April 22nd through the 25th, 2016. Do we need to mention anything other than that, Dr. Gallo? Nope. Uh, six point, oh, I missed this one. 6.8, to receive notification of the overnight field trip of the high school band, chorus, orchestra to Chicago, Illinois on March 31st to April 3rd. And then 6.9 to receive notification of the resignation of Michaela uh, Souza, payroll supervisor, effective February 19, 2016. Moving on to, I know we have something for 48 hours in um, executive session. Do we have anything else in 48 hours? No, we do not. Good. Subcommittee reports. Cynthia, anything new? 
moment. Dr. Schreier, I know you have been busy. You're all set with your warrant? Yes. Good. We will see you in executive. Mm -hmm. Liza, you covered everything? Yeah. Policy? Ray? I was just going to ask you um, if, uh, if we've heard anything about when they intend to vote. Um, Hawk. I mean, I know they tend to finish budgets and then move on to warrant articles, but they've been voting some, I think they had some warrant articles on tomorrow night, in fact, that they're voting. So do we have any sense of when they're... So I, as, as I remember from the last meeting, the Board of Selectmen, we were voting Hawk on the 25th, this Thursday. I have not heard from uh, advisory. <coughs> So I know we sent the selectmen mm -hmm. some additional information. Yes, um, we did. Have we heard anything in response? Uh, no. Now, when we presented to advisory last week, was it? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you've received anything or you. Re I've received no questions or comments from advisory, zero. So I assume they love it, they're ready to support it, and they're all on board. <laughs> I don't know if it's that's, that's the case or whether they've been so. Like <laughs> you know, well, they've been doing other things. Optimist. But I mean, we're happy to answer questions, provide right. information. But if there's no, none forthcoming, then we assume they're just going to vote it as it is. And what? Why don't um, I'll reach out to Jim Taylor since he's the point person on this. Yeah. To see if he, if he has any questions, either plan to meet us there at 6:25 tomorrow, before the they vote on their AESC meeting, or right afterwards. Um, and then we will follow up with them on that. But Thursday night, we'll probably have to divide and hopefully conquer because there are so many votes by both boards on the same night, fortunately, next door. So in, in tomorrow night, we have two meetings, and they're opposite the high school program of studies. I think program of studies is, is March 1st. No, it's not. No. Well, tomorrow. Tomorrow and Thursday is the middle school program right. of studies. Right, so it's unfortunate. Poor planning. <laughs> talked about that before <laughs> all right so I like to Andy, let me just jump it on yes sorry it's, I didn't go to the meeting but uh, on Wednesday the 24th the Hingham uh, drug opiate <coughs> college <coughs> is coming up uh, I'm sure dr. Gallo can jump in it's 5 p.m. on room. Wednesday the 24th which is day after tomorrow and uh, inviting and citizens one of the speakers to join will be uh, judge Heather Bradley and the other uh, speaker, if you will, will be uh, a couple of the students from the High School SAD group um, who are going to come and talk about what they've been doing and uh, with the end goal of perhaps doing a project together with the coalition group. I'd like to make a motion to go into executive session to discuss collective bargaining issues, not to return to public session. Everyone must sign off individually. All right. A second Aye. first. Oh, can I have a second first? I'll second. Second. Can I? Aye. 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 Nine fifty-two.